Thank you very much. And thank you for having me. It's, it's good to be back in Berlin with such nice weather as well. Um, yesterday over beers, when we were enjoying the barbecue, somebody said, you don't like Google very much. And I was like, well, I actually ask questions. And I think questions are important for us to understand how we use the technology. And in that sense, I actually stole a slide from somebody from Autodesk called Prolet, who's based in San Francisco. And she, we both come out of the digital analytics industry. So I started with Google Analytics a long time ago. And she had this very nice slide about hunting down vendors and trying to understand what they're up to, to make sure that you're compliant with the GDPR. So I like the, the nice cat. Basically, this is also what I do and why I usually wear pink, because I'm a nice person who just asks questions to make sure that we're all accountable. Because it's one of the principles of the GDPR, Article 5.2, where basically we should go towards this idea of responsible uses of information, moving beyond just managing data. I think this is important to understand, and through my entire career, I've used data. I love data. Um, I'm terrible at coding. I found that out very early on when I did basic coding at school. Maybe my teacher was just bad. But basically, I like data. But I'm also worried about what data brings because of the history of my family and because most of the time, I'm also an outlier. I do things differently. I live in Spain, I speak French, I'm Dutch, and I work in English. So when we talk, for example, about differential privacy or ways to anonymize data, well, that outlier is typically me or my family. So this is actually why I care so much about data, but also about making sure this is balanced with the, the European project. Um, a couple of days ago, or last week, I was in, in in London for the Strata conference, where I talked for about three and a half hours about the GDPR. So I talked to engineers like yourselves, data scientists about the law, and I talked to lawyers about technology. And usually both of you freak out at some point, which is fine, we just need to have conversations. But it was interesting to see at Strata this banner talking about the problem, solving problems with data. And a week before that, I was in Brussels talking about ethics, and somebody from the Accountability Foundation was talking about the fact that he wanted a car that could predict when he would have an accident, because that person is over 70 years old, and, well, he's getting dangerous on the road. And I was sitting next to the folks of the Commission of Ethics, and we looked at each other, and we were like, driver's license in the United States? How does that work again? Did that guy on the road, was that a good idea, actually, even if he has a great, great car? Um, and before that, I was talking also to um, Sheila of Axiom. I like Axiom uh, more than Google, but I have to confess. Um, and she was also talking about certain problems that were being solved through data. And it struck me because these problems are not similar to mine. And so a question that I was wondering is whether our values actually influence the problems we're trying to solve. And in that sense, certain problems that certain entities are trying to solve are maybe not the same problems that we have. And this is also where I think the GDPR is the start of a journey, where basically we need to think about what we do with the data and also the consequence of the data. And there's an interesting story, as I said, I'm Dutch, um, an interesting story in the Netherlands where many years ago they wanted to make sure that people were buried according to their religious rights. And so what they did is that they created lists of people and their religion. What happened next was World War II and the invasions of the Germans. So the lists were useful. So be careful what you do with the data. And as I heard yesterday about ranting about data retention periods, there's a reason why we shouldn't hold on to data for too long. 
And there's a reason why we have principles related to how we use data in the best possible ways to solve problems. What we're facing today is our many questions. Our societies are changing one way or another, and I usually compare um, European law to the Sagrada Familia. So I don't know if you guys have been to Barcelona, but it's a cathedral by Gaudi that has been building up for many, many years. And European legislation is a bit like that as well, as it's based on common law legislation, which is not the same thing, sorry, it's based on civil law legislation, which is not the same thing as common law in the United States. So from the beginning, the way we build legislation in different continents is not the same. As such, the United States and Anglo-Saxon countries are outliers as they have give more power to um, the courts and uh, jurisprudence, which is not the same thing as our construction of the European values, which can be compared to the Sagrada Familia. And today, we will have to solve for many different problems. And in that sense, the GDPR is basically a starting point. This is a history of where the GDPR comes from, in case you thought it kind of fell out of the sky. It started after World War II. So if there is maybe something or a movie you want to see to understand the fundamentals of um, GDPR legislation, there's a Netflix series called The Tokyo Trials, which tries to understand how to judge war criminals after World War I, knowing also that they need to align with the Nuremberg Trials. In that sense, this cathedral we're trying to build needs to be aligned with what we've done in the past. And a lot of people always compare technology to legal, but what I've seen is in the past, and certainly for companies that have been there for a couple of years, they have challenges related to the GDPR and obligations certainly related to data subject rights because of the way they built their infrastructure. So while technology is about legal, so is the law. And actually the law is a much more powerful legal box tool than technology is, but where we need to make sure that it aligns with the history that we've built. And this is what basically a lot of technology companies are facing today, is I built my infrastructure in this way, hence I cannot be compliant with the GDPR. And this is where a lot of legal experts also say it's not because your technology doesn't allow you to be compliant, that it makes it compliant. So history plays a, an important role. And in that sense, this is where it all started. This idea of human rights, the Declaration of Human Rights that was published by Eleanor Roosevelt in 1948, which is also why we created the United Nations. And you can say, well, it's not very useful, and who cares, and there's boats of refugees in Italy that nobody wants. But we are trying to build our societies according to certain values. And in that sense, we all have a role to play as employees of technology companies, as data subjects, as parents, but everybody has a role to play inside here to make sure that we align with that. And this is what the GDPR is trying to do. The GDPR is basically a mix between the digital single market we want to build, hopefully 28 countries, maybe 27, and three others, so 30 or 31, but balanced with the evolution of this Declaration of Human Rights, which is the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. So, as a technician, I wouldn't recommend you read the GDPR, 99 articles, 173 recitals. It's a bit much to digest, to be honest. But the charter, read the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Keep that in mind when you're building, when you're processing data, collecting data. This, these are the values that we want to protect moving forward. And it's not just Europe. It is a global movement. The United Nations recognize the right to digital um, privacy 
a couple of years back. And now we're talking about supervisory authorities on a global level. So it's not just Europe, it's really a global movement as we digitalize our societies. In that sense, as I said, it's like a cathedral we built on top of things through history. In that sense, the GDPR basically addresses Article 8 of the, the Charter, and e-privacy, you might have heard about as well, addresses Article 7. The fundamental um, uh, uh, value that we're trying to protect is human dignity. This idea that you should be allowed to choose your life and to be yourself, which is also recognized by movements like the Anne Frank Foundation, where they go around the world explaining what happened during World War II. So I have here a slide to, that compares GDPR to say whether it's good or bad for technology. I'll let you read it at some point. But technology is obviously transforming our societies. And in that sense, a legislation like the GDPR is actually important. There are things that we're seeing evolve when it comes to new incumbents within our societies that are not ideal. So I live in Madrid. I have friends in Barcelona. They don't like Airbnb. Airbnb is changing the way that their neighborhoods are functioning. And I'm seeing it where my mother-in-law lives. People with suitcases moving around, a lot of noise, and the fruit shop kind of disappears. You can't live in certain neighborhoods anymore. So it's not just about solving problems for your company, it's about how society is changing overall. And the thing is also, there's not the same way of thinking about it between Europe and the United States. As I mentioned before, this idea of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, for us, privacy, data privacy, is about rights. The United States talks about the data market, which is where, for example, the French don't like this idea that I am my data. My data is part of me, it reflects part of me, but it's not something that can be sold or shared one way or another, and we need to find ways to work better in order to make sure that our values are supported through time. So this is also what the GDPR says basically in RESTO 6. It talks about the fact that processing personal data should be designed to serve mankind. It also continues by saying that it's not an absolute right. And this is something you'll probably see a couple of times through your work where one Maybe legal counsel will say, you have to delete the data. And your compliance officer will say, ah, no, no, no. We work in this kind of sector and we need to keep it. So you have to balance these different obligations and rights. It's not about um, not allowing people to use their data. It's about making sure that we're all accountable for what we actually do. So the reason why we talk about the GDPR is obviously the fines. If the fines weren't there, if that stick wasn't there, we wouldn't follow the carrot. So this is why we obviously talk about this. This is a representation of all the articles and how they interlink. So as I said, I won't tell you that it's easy, but it's certainly interesting to understand. And if you understand the charter, I think we're going in a, in a good direction. What does the GDPR do? Basically, what the GDPR tries to do is to reintroduce those rights within the data ecosystem. So it's obviously about companies being compliant, laws being pushed by government. It's about industry organizations trying to define standards. And this is only starting. We're not there yet. But it's certainly about data subjects, citizens, you, me, my mother-in-law, your grandmothers and everybody that is around you, sharing data more and more because our societies are being digitalized. And the GDPR didn't happen in a vacuum. So obviously we talk about this because of the fines, but we're also seeing that the systems are getting more and more complex. If I try to define data flows of my mobile phone between my ISP, my OS, the apps that I have on this, 
It's not easy at all. So our systems are becoming more complex. We need to become more accountable for how we push data from different systems and how we actually use it. And this is also a challenge for supervisory authorities, because when you read the law, they talk about controllers and processors and maybe joint controllers. Reality is a lot more complex. So communication with supervisory authorities about what you do, making sure you're on the right way, is important today to assure this accountability. And because moving forward, this is not just about your company. This is about the societies we're going to build with Internet of Things, machine-to-machine -machine data transfers, and in the end, data that's going to be, make decisions about our lives. This is a picture of customer service that I saw at San Francisco Airport about 10 years ago. It reflects what I think about customer service. There's nobody there. So every time you call a call center, it's about DAO 1 for this and DAO 2 for that. My issues are usually rather complicated. I prefer to talk to a person. So we have come to a point where technology can do a lot of things, but now it's time to start balancing the uses of it and making sure it aligns with our values. The other picture is an example of what's, for example, going on in the United States. You might have heard about this, algorithms that define how long the sentence of people will be who are in front of a court. Within European legislation, that would never exist because you have a right to understand what the input is of algorithms, what the outputs are, certainly if they influence your lives. And while we talk often about credit scoring, for example, knowing how much time you're going to spend in jail certainly does influence your life. So it's interesting to see how these debates, certainly between the United States and Europe, but also looking more towards um, Asian countries, are going to evolve to try to maybe solve this or get better at making sure we build the societies that we actually want. Something that is also coming out more and more is that we build models and we build systems, algorithms, that kind of spit out a solution at, point, at one point in time. Data changes, people's lives change. There's a limit to how much you can modelize the lives of individuals. And even the European Court of Justice understands that if you start defining models, you have to revisit them from time to time. And this is what we've seen, for example, within the issues within the financial sector. They created models for hedge funds, and well, the outcome wasn't great. And what we're seeing also is people are getting more savvy about how their data is being used. So this is a friend of mine, Paul Olivier de Haye. You might have seen him next to this guy called Christopher Wiley with the red hair in front of the, European, the UK Parliament. He started a movement a couple of years ago about how to ask your data from Cambridge Analytica. He worked then together with The Guardian. And from there, well, basically, he built a website where you can ask for your data from Cambridge Analytica. And so that information, those requests are called subject access requests, or SARS. And this is a bit what I wanted to talk about today. So let's talk about the law. This is the representation, the logo of the Dutch Supervisory Authority. I think they have a good description of what's actually going on. It's not about personal data or non-personal data or anonymization data. It's about bits of me, little bits that come together and that in the end, certainly if I'm an outlier, can define me one way or another. 15 years ago in the United States, Letania Sweeney showed that if you took zip code, dates of birth and gender, you could identify 80% of the population in the United States. This is a reality. We all know that. We also know that with four points of geolocation, we know who the person is and where that person lives. That's been proved by a Belgian mathematician working for MIT. 
So it exists. We know the power of data. The question is how are we going to make sure that we're at least compliant and hopefully build towards more ethical data uses. So if I had to sum up the GDPR in one picture, it's that. So I'm not going to talk about everything, but if somebody asks you, what is this thing called GDPR, send them the picture, nice and easy. What I did want to talk about a bit are the obligations under the GDPR within the data ecosystem. And in that sense, that model kind of looks like this. So in the center are what's called data controllers, the banks, the pharmaceutical companies, any company you do business with or you're a customer of. Data controllers are responsible in front of data subjects, so the citizens. They also use tools behind them to do their processing. They're called data processors, and behind there might be sub-processors like cloud service providers. The big challenge today, as the GDPR reinforces these rights for data subjects, is to assure that, well, they can actually comply with these rights. So these are the rights that I want to talk about. And what happens if people start complaining or asking for their rights and the companies don't reply, well, then these data subjects comply, complain to the supervisory authorities. In this case, it's the ICO in the UK. Germany has supervisory authorities per lender, so that makes it interesting as well, certainly if you listen to Schleswig, Holstein, Hamburg or Berlin. Um, but then these supervisory authorities who have an obligation to take in those complaints, talk to data protection officers within companies to make sure that they have abided by the principles. And so a lot of companies are worried that basically one, well, trouble is coming, which is true, but it's not as if the supervisory authorities are going to knock on the door of companies and say, hey, here's a bill for 20 million euros. They're going to ask questions just like I do when I talk to processors. And they are going to have a conversation and where the company, the data controller, will have to prove that they are accountable. And this doesn't mean you have to solve for everything, but at least show you have tried to do the right thing. And it's through these conversations that we'll be able to do better. So keep your eyes open related to any questions that come from supervisory authorities, and please, Try not to be too negative when legal counsel knocks on your door. So the question, the, the, the theme I want to talk about today are data subject rights. So it's mainly article 15 to 22. There are, as I said, 99 article in the GDPR. Some of them are actually not new. So the right to access that was introduced within the GDPR back in the directive actually is something that's not new. You as a data subject can send an email to any company you're doing business with and say, what kind of data do you have about me? So think about that. What are the consequences of such rights on the way your data is being processed within your company? Article 16 talks about the right to rectification. Then you kind of go down the line and be more specific. The right to erasure, the right to be forgotten, you might have heard about. That companies like a big company in the United States compared to book burning under the Nazi period. Like we don't exactly look at it in the same way. The right to be forgotten is about making sure that mistakes you've done in the past will not continue to haunt you for the next couple of years. So what happens to Articles 16 and 17? Well, it's interesting because things are obviously moving. And certainly since the GDPR came into force, the stances are changing. Two years ago, when we talked to processors and we said, hey, if I get a request for deletion, will you help out? And this is where most processors would say, no, because it's not PII. And this is where controllers say, well, you know, there are these fines, 
So it would be nice if we could actually align and make sure that you can help us out because I don't want to pay the fines. And so within the GDPR, there's also an obligation to make sure that this is decided contractually speaking. So the name of the game for the moment has been about signing data protection addendums between processors and controllers, making sure the lawyers hedge for their risk. But the thing is those contracts need to translate into what we actually do with the data. So this is where it gets interesting because you need to start looking at those contracts and define and make sure that you agree on what personal data is. And this is often a point of contention as well. Personal data is not PII. Personal data is broader than PII. PII is a subset of personal data. It's been defined per US state. So there are 50 lists of PII in the United States. Hair color is one in California, who would have thought? Gender is considered personal data in Spain in most contracts. So these discussions about it is or it is not are actually not very useful because basically what you're trying to do is make sure that you can do business and you're all accountable. So think about that when you use data, merge data, are you getting closer to uniquely identifying an individual or not? I saw interesting presentations yesterday and one about IP addresses. IP addresses are personal data. So I was through that presentation wondering about consent, but apparently the, the presentation wasn't about that. In any case, data subject rights are not rights that apply by default. So this is the position of MasterCard. Each company will have their own position, but what certainly happens when people send through those data subject requests is that this is not going to happen automatically. There are rules and definitions as to when data subjects actually apply. So ideally, <clears throat> your legal counsel or privacy officer or ideally data protection officer should think about how these information, these requests are being received and how are they actually being passed down the line. They will not always apply, but they'll have to have a communication with the data subjects to explain what's going on and how they can actually do that. And so this is where I can sh share with you a lot of legislation, legislative bits, but I don't think it's very useful, but it's interesting to understand that you can't really do this programmatically, certainly not in the beginning. So different recitals to take note of. So I think it's important to understand that right to access is about the fact that I want to know what type of data you have about me. So it's not I want a data dump, like from Facebook, it's about what are you using? It's open question. It's a start of a conversation with your customers to understand what kind of data there's there. What's important to understand also is that a company has one month to reply. So it doesn't mean that they need to solve everything within one month, but they have an obligation to start that conversation within one month. So think about that and how these processes would be set up Logically speaking, you will receive requests not from the outside, but from within your company to see how you can solve it and have a conversation about that. So those subject access requests also require to develop some form of a authentication procedure. If you're going to share information with somebody who's supposed to be a customer of yours or a client or a user, you have to make sure that that person is actually who, who he or she says she is. And this is where legislation is kind of a bit far from your reality. Typically the lawyers talk about asking for a photocopy of the identity card or the passport. When we're talking about, for example, the gaming sector and apps on your mobile phones, it wouldn't make sense to actually ask for a photocopy. 
I can have direct links to data subject requests where they can push through their IDs related to, to the game that they're actually playing. So be wary about what lawyers say, oh, you need a photocopy of the passport. I don't want to be sitting on data about people's passports because that is also personal data and God knows that needs to be secured. So think about these identification procedures. How would that work within the line of business you are in? If you're a bank, it's not the same thing as if you're Rovio who does Angry Birds. So these are things to think about. The right to rectification is about this idea that, well, I don't want to have wrong data about me following me around. A couple of months back, I was listening to the University of Tilburg, who was talking about group privacy. And they said, imagine your grandchildren are going to have decisions about their lives imported onto them because of stuff you did 50 years ago. That sounds ridiculous. But this might happen if we're not careful and if we don't think about, well, you know, how our data is actually being managed, how long we keep it, and if the quality of it is actually any good. So from the right to rectification, going down the list, we have the right to erasure. And again, it's not an absolute right. There are moments when, well, these, this data needs to be kept. Typical examples are, I am an employee, I have obligations to keep employee data for five to seven years, depending on the country where I'm in. But it's important to acknowledge these requests. I get these requests, I answer within a month, and I explain why it's possible or it's not possible. This is also where we see that as systems are intricately linked with one another, it's not always easy to delete all the data. So a lot of systems, what they're doing is deleting the keys so that I can't join it together anymore, which is nice. <clears throat> it's a short-term solution to the problem. Longer term, ideally, that data should expire, be deleted, to make sure that you respect the data minimization principle. So sometimes when you think about these requests, it requires different steps. Today we'll do this. In 24 months, our data retention period kicks in, the data will be deleted, and so I can make sure all the data is actually gone. So again, these are conversations to have with data subjects to a certain point, but certainly with supervisory authorities on making sure you actually do the right thing according to the accountability principle. So what's interesting within our societies is that basically this compliance obligation is not seen in the same way by different actors. And certainly if these actors are spread across different continents with different bases for the rule of law, well, basically you have to have conversations with your subprocessors or your processors to make sure that if you are a controller, you play the right role and do not get the fines. Note that there's a possibility to also then go against the, control, the processors behind you to push on the fines onto them as well. So again, this idea of accountability, we created a data ecosystem. Now we're trying to make sure that they abide by the values within um, our societies. So something to note as well is this idea of erasure actually applies to all the copies you have as well. And this is where you can start thinking about best practices. If it applies to all copies I've made, and within my company I have no problems with making copies of master data, maybe that's not the greatest of ideas. So basically the GDPR is trying to solve for data quality, making sure the structure of your data is better set, better defined, master data management and data governance are clearly part of the entire equation around compliance. And as I said before, is it going to be automated deletion? Well, it depends again on the type of company you are. If I am MasterCard or I'm Visa or a bank, probably I log in somewhere. I can ask for deletion of my data through some form of a portal. 
it's not the same thing if I'm a so, small startup in San Francisco. So when lawyers say, and you, get, you have questions for the lawyers, and they actually say, it depends, well, because it does depend. The way compliance works or alignment with the GDPR depends on your situation, the type of data you have, and your structure as well. It's like when you ask things about technology, should I implement Kafka or Streams or HDFS or whatever, it depends. And this hasn't been solved in like six months. We still see evolutions related to these technologies as well. So why would you require from lawyers to actually have the magical bullet at the same time within one conversation of half an hour? Think about it and think about this idea of accountability and responsibility. So, um, yeah, so I think this is rather, rather clear. Um, other articles, mainly articles 18, 21, and 22, are slightly more complex. So it's not just about access or deletion or rectification. It's about the fact that, well, I don't want you to process my data. I understand that as a data subject, you need to process my data to send me an invoice, but I'm not super happy with you profiling me and sending me specific information about products I've never asked for. So this sits within the restriction of processing, which is Article 18, a right as well. The consequences of that are interesting because it means that you'll have to flag certain customers who have not agreed to certain processing operations to exclude them from certain systems. So it means that you start to think about what are those data processing operations. When I collect the data, when I process the data, when I stream the data, when I view the data, processing is very broad within the GDPR. What do I do with that data? And what do I promise that I will do with that data? And how can they make their choice known related to what they want to be done with that data? So restriction of processing will probably push you towards separating your processing operations and also your clients to make sure that you process according to what they have agreed with and what makes sense. We used to be all about, let's collect everything and see what, what comes out of it. The GDPR kind of pushes this back because of the fines and because of, well, basically the rights of data subjects towards an idea of collect what you need. It doesn't say <clears throat> you're not allowed to do anything anymore. It says you have to be accountable. You have to define what you're going to do with that. And in that sense, that definition sits within the notion of purpose. There is a reason why I collect something. The biggest challenge today is defining that purpose, but also how that purpose actually stretches. What are customer expectations and how far, when we stretch that purpose, how close do we get to actually being creepy? So again, expectations of customers and trying to define why you're collecting the data while maybe being, well, a bit more conservative about everything that you're, you're collecting. This is also where, in one of the presentations yesterday, somebody talked about agile companies, but also collaborative companies. I had never heard the term before, but I think it's really where we need to go towards. Being agile, allows you to move away from this idea of let's collect everything and in case we need it, we'll see. Because you're more agile, you could actually go back and collect what you need for a further purpose. Being collaborative means that through your different departments, you understand how you use the data. And this is where I think we should all strive towards. Data portability is totally a new right within the GDPR. It's fascinating. I think data portability is really interesting. The way companies see it today is the obligation to push out data if citizens want it. So it doesn't go any further than that. What is interesting within that as well is this idea that, well, 
it doesn't include inferred data. So it's all the data that basically customers have shared with you or have shared through clicking on websites or different uses of their tools or things like that. If you define that somebody has a high propension for suicide, probably that's not part of data portability. So data portability is about this idea of what do I have about customers that they gave me and how do I push it out? The long-term idea is data democratization. If we get more and more companies helping customers get their subject access requests, we kind of create a pile of data. That data could actually serve in solving other kinds of problems. And this is where I think Europe has an advantage. I looked, for example, at the presentation yesterday um, from the transportation industry in Norway, which was interesting. But collaboration between public and private companies is basically what data portability is all about. The thing is, the GDPR doesn't define that market. GDPR just says you have to push out the data. And then we'll see what else is going to be created. I think this is the biggest opportunity within the GDPR, except for data quality and making sure we build moving forward for better societies overall. A last one, Article 22, which is also being discussed a lot, certainly within digital, is this discussion about you have the right not to be subject to automated decision making, including profiling. So the interesting part of this is, well, if you gave explicit consent, that doesn't apply. So if somebody says, I don't want to be profiled, I don't want to have automated decision making about me, but that person gave their consent, this is one of these rules that you need to have within your systems to say, ah, it's based on explicit consent. So what you should do is first withdraw your consent, which is something that is defined within the GDPR. And then we can have a conversation about this. The reason this exists is because, well, these kinds of automated decision making are actually making decisions about our lives. So the typical examples for this are credit scoring. If I ask for a credit at a bank and I get refused, I can ask for an explanation. I can ask to say, okay, what did you do and where does it actually come from? So it can happen actually before you start a contract with a company. So it basically allows for more transparency within the data world, which is, I think, rather important. It is also possible to use this, and I, I won't read everything, if we're talking about legitimate interests. So one of the presentations yesterday talked about the different ways to make data processing lawful. There are six ways to make data processing lawful within the GDPR. Consent is just one of them. And obviously the other one is legitimate interest. But the thing is the GDPR also says that a company can use that lawful basis of processing in their legitimate interest if it doesn't go against the fundamental rights of um, data subjects. So while I understand that legitimate interest is an interesting way to assure that your processing is lawful, it also kind of feels more like a philosophical essay about data subject harms than actually pushing data through consent mechanisms. So if somebody tells you, oh, we're using legitimate interest, be wary about that. Make sure that they have done their homework related to that. I know it's not your job, but legitimate interest is not a wild card to do whatever you want when it comes to um, data processing. Profiling, defined within Article 22, is broader than what it used to be. Um, talking to so certain American lawyers, what they basically said is profiling is a very bad word in European legislation. And it's true. So if you are going to do profiling one way or another, there are 
obligations, sorry, to undergo what's called data protection impact assessments. It's basically a list of questions you have to go through and which will define measures to make sure that your compliance obligations are well balanced. If you work within these kinds of projects, it's great to have DPIAs because DPIAs support accountability and support documentation as well. And you can find them within the French um, supervisory authorities, the Spaniards, everybody has their list of data protection impact assessments. These are great tools to make sure that you are compliant. So look for them. It's not fun, but at least it allows you to understand what you can do and what you can't do, and to actually prove you have done the right thing if somebody knocks on your door. So automated decision makings, <clears throat> Basically, as I said, credit scores, loans, educational scoring. When I talked about the fact that my grandchildren might be rated based on what I did, I'm very scared about the data that is being collected by my, my children. But let's see what happens in, in the long term. But if they get refused into any kind of education, I, as a European subject, have the right to ask where that information comes from. And again, it's based on this idea of the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Even though the GDPR doesn't talk about discrimination, it's about this. It's about making sure we can live fulfilled lives in the long term. And there are still issues that are really open out there. Price discrimination by airlines. Is that lawful? We'll see how the courts will figure that one out. So, if I had to, to wrap up the reality check, at least in my digital world, well, usually technology looks like this. And where I see also companies talking a lot about digital transformation or data lakes or big data projects, but without a lot of structure around it. So it would be interesting, and this is what the GDPR is trying to push, to start making sure you are accountable for your data processing operation and understand how that data is actually being used. Note that a lot of tools that I use today, even though they have, for example, consent mechanisms, don't even talk about purpose. So this is what we need to start thinking about moving forward. Some numbers. So the GDPR got enforced on the 25th of May of this year. The Dutch received 170 complaints in the first week. The Irish supervisory authority, which is an interesting door for American companies on the European continent, 1,300. The Spaniards are estimating at 10,000 complaints this year. Note that the Spanish LOPD is the closest to the GDPR. So for them, it's a piece of cake. They haven't finished their implementation of the GDPR yet. The law is not there. And they'll probably add new stuff, knowing the Spaniards. On our side, as DPO for a customer data platform called um, Embarticle, we have received uh, over 3,000 requests now. We can solve for about 12% of them. And why is that? Well, because identity it's not easy to define. So I just want to have a quick show of hands. Who knows what an IDFA is? What's an IDFA? Apple IDs for advertising. Who knows what ad IDs are? Google IDs, yes. Do you know where to find them? Do you know where to find the ID of a specific app? And how do you fill a subject access request? Well, basically, you just send an email to the company and see what comes back. It's a nice exercise. And does anybody know how to complain to the supervisory authority? Well, usually you go to their website and you'll find one way or another to complain to them. So I'd like to finish with this. The legislation is not perfect. I hear complaining about it every day. It's like, oh, the legislation is so unclear. It's not a technical requirement. That's your job. The job of lawyers is to work together and supervisory authorities to make sure that, well, we understand each other and we foster data exchanges and certainly define purpose of the uses of our data. 
I'm happy with the 12% resolution rate at mparticle, and we're trying to find ways to make that better. And what we should actually focus on is, as I mentioned, purpose classification. What are you using the data for? And this is where you have conversations with your legal counsel to say, I'm using it for this. Is that description good enough? Oh, we might add that kind of work to make sure that it's a bit extendable. These are known practices. You can do that. But you have to start working on this idea of purpose classification. God knows Apple has started in 2016. Your apps could not access personal data on your mobile phone unless a certain field was filled in. The big question is, what is Apple sitting on currently? And the mystery hasn't been unfolded yet. Ideally, purpose should look like accounting. Within a company, money comes in, money goes out. There are accounting principles. This is what we need to build for data as well. And things like consent trails, um, traceability or lineage, are things that are starting to exist. Now we have to start to work together to make sure that accountability actually works across the data ecosystem. So I started my career when that one came out, the data deluge. I was like, ah, oh, so much data, great. I don't have to go to the statistical society in Belgium and get diskettes about information. I'm really happy about that. But due to the history of my family and the fact that I'm an outlier, I'm really worried about the future of our societies as well. And this is where basically we need your help, thinking about what is the GDPR trying to accomplish in order to make sure that we build better societies moving forward. So I couldn't say en enough, read the Charter of Fundamental Rights. If you don't want to read the GDPR, it's fine but read the Charter of Fundamental Rights, because basically that's what we're trying to solve for. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aurely. Uh, we got some time for one or two questions. Are there questions, remarks, comments in the audience? Is there a question? I'm not sure. Uh, well, I got one, uh, Aurely. Uh, coming from the technical side of things, uh, building data systems, uh, I'm wondering how we can better navigate this gray zone of, uh, is my system compliant or not, or does it, does it allow for compliancy? We have this uh, wonderful ecosystem of the Apache Big Data stack, mm -hmm. and we, we build solutions out of uh, many different components, dozens if not hundreds. Do we now start, need to start putting stamps, compliancy stamps on, on components and say, hey, uh, with this, I'm sure I, I persist buffer cache data, but I can also remove it. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> um, I think that when we talk about compliance, um, as I showed in the beginning, uh, compliance to GDPR means a lot of things. Um, and the, the first discussions we had um, was basically about where the data was. So if you want to talk about compliance of systems, probably the first question to ask is, where is your data? What are we talking about? So the GDPR doesn't want to um, not allow data to go beyond Europe, but it would like for fundamental rights to be on the same level for the country where the data is also going. So usually the first questions are about those systems and when they're distributed, what kind of countries are you using? And are you making sure that the rights of individuals are also abided by within these different countries? The next question then is often, are you collecting personal data? Which then opens up a Pandora's box, because as we saw, personal data is pretty broad. Um, but I think the general idea is to say, well, there are principles within the GDPR. Can I abide by them? Is my data fair? Do I have data retention periods? I should go down the checklist and then making sure that I have a method for processing data in a lawful way. So you can basically build checklists related to that and then have conversations about when you don't, you're not sure and 
try to define ways to mitigate your risk related to being compliant. Because it's about that. It's about mitigating the potential risk that somebody complains or somebody knocks on your door to say, that's not good. So. Thank you. Are there questions in the meantime? Well, if not, uh, this concludes our keynote session. Uh, thank you again. Thanks Thank again, you for the having speaker. Me. Thank you very much. <laughs>